Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Martin Luther King has a short sermon called Unfulfilled Hopes, which is about how we respond to what he calls the tragic element in life, which might be greater in some person's lives or situations than in others. His own is a prime example and that of the community that he is trying to appeal to and uplift and give some, some encouragement to through this sermon, also some guidance. So he tells us that the sermon brings us face to face with one of the most persistent realities in human experience. What is that? Very few people are privileged to live life with all of their dreams realized and their hopes fulfilled. Who here this morning has not had to face the agony of blasted hopes and shattered dreams? And he's going to use St. Paul and the development of uh, Christianity and Christ himself as examples of this. But we could think about many, many others as well in other traditions. And so he begins with talking about St. Paul. So St. Paul had wanted to go to Rome and to Spain, and he does get to one, but he doesn't get to the other. And so the way he depicts it here. Uh, Paul writes these words to the Roman Christians. Whenever I go into Spain, I will come on to you. So he's got a dream. He's got a plan. In other words, uh, he says, um, whenever I go to Spain, I will stop by to see you. This is one of the high hopes of Paul's life. This desire to go to Spain and why to Spain. It's on the edge of the known world and to carry the gospel to that distant land. And on the way, he would stop to see the Christians in Rome, the capital city of the world. So he's got this big plan that he's telling people about. And what happens instead? So like Martin Luther King says, well, he does get to go to Rome, but he doesn't go to Rome to preach the gospel in the way that he originally intended. He's going to die in Rome as a martyr. He's never going to get to go on to Spain, right? So he says that uh, he had to spend his days in Rome in a little cell, right? The story of Paul's life is the story, the tragic story of unfulfilled hopes and shattered dreams. Now, he doesn't talk about this here, but we could say, well, but look at all the other things that Paul was able to accomplish. He wrote all these letters and went to all these places. Sure, but this was what he was aiming at. And Martin Luther King says, well, this is not unique. This is not unusual. Pretty much all of this, all of us are going to face something like this. He says, in a real sense, my friends, this is the persistent story of life. Almost everybody here this morning has started out on some distant trip to reach some distant Spain to achieve some distant goal, to realize some distant dream, only to discover life stopped short of that. And it could be anything that you like. We never got an opportunity, he says, to walk as free men in the roams of our lives. We ended up so often confined in a little cell that had been built up around us by the forces of circumstance. This is the story of life. No, the question is, how should we respond to this? How should we regard this? And so he talks about, you know, the symphony of life. And what we're talking about here is sort of the grand panorama, the, if you like, universal and historical. 
He says that the early Christian church didn't overlook this tragic element in life. There is a cross at the center of life. And he says, life is not a great symphony with all the instruments playing harmoniously together. We will look at it long enough. We will discover there is a jangling discord. So somebody's not playing quite as they should. People are out of time. The instruments are squeaking or too loud or swallowed up by the other instruments. Some people are actually playing a different song than the one that everybody else or most other people think that we're supposed to be playing and it can come to dominate. We can go further than this. It's not just that things are out of, dis, are out of accord, out of whack with each other. He talks about evil. And so he tells us, that um, the nagging prehensile tentacles of evil are always present, taking some of the meaning out of life. King knows there is genuine evil in the world. There is genuine evil in the hearts and choices and actions and policies of human beings. He doesn't have any problem saying that this is the case. And so what do we find out? He says that, you know, people are very frustrated about it. And they wonder if life has any justice to it. He says, um, we've looked at the stars. We find ourselves saying these stars shine from their cold and serene and passionless height, totally indifferent to the joys and sorrows of us human beings. We begin to ask is, uh, the human being, a plaything of a callous nature, sometimes friendly, sometimes inimical, an enemy, right? Is man thrown out as a sort of orphan in the terrifying immensities of space with nobody to guide him on and nobody concerned about him? He's saying this as a minister in a church. It's possible that nobody cares. And he says, we come back to that point of our text in our prophet we come back to the point of seeing in life that there are unfulfilled hopes. There are moments when our dreams are not realized. And we should pause on that for a moment. He's going to pass on very quickly uh, into the rhetoric of this. But dreams, all of us dream of something, not just when we're asleep and logic goes out the window, if we remember any of that. We have our dreams for ourselves. We envision ourselves in certain situations. It could be about success in the workplace. It could be about writing a wonderful piece of music or a novel. It could be about loving and being loved by somebody whose eye has, uh, you know, caught our own. And all, a lot of the time, these dreams are unfulfilled. We could even just dream about not living in pain, bodily pain, humiliation being treated as a person. So he goes on and says, we discover in our lives that all pain is never relieved. We discover sooner or later, all hopes are never realized. The things that we hope for ourselves, not only for ourselves, but that we hope for others are often not realized as well. Or if they are, it's always only partial. It's never going to be exactly what we wanted for them or for ourselves. He says, we come to the point of seeing that no matter how long we pray for them sometimes, and no, how, no matter how long we cry out for a solution to our problems, no matter how much we desire it, we don't get the answer. The only answer we get is a fading echo of our desperate cry, of our lonely cry. And then he talks about Christ. He says, Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane praying the cup would be removed from him, but he has to drink it with all of its bitterness and its pain. So even, you know, for Christianity, this superlative God man is going to be disappointed, frustrated, have hopes, dreams not fulfilled. Is there a solution to this? And we human beings do find, as King is going to outline here, a variety of solutions, some of which are not great solutions. He's advocating one of these and warning us about the other two. So what is the first? There is the response of what he calls bitterness. And this is a response that pushes back against life, but not directly, only indirectly 
through people and other things which can be more tangible, more targeted. So he says that some people get caught up in this response. They feel that the best way they end up dealing with their frustrations by taking out some of their anger with the universe, their anger with life on other people and other things. In short, they become mean. And he says, you've seen mean people. You can do a psycho psychological analysis of them. And if you do that, you will find that they had some hopes and some dreams that were unfulfilled and they are angry. They are bitter. They bear a, as he calls it, demoniacal grudge against life. But there's no way to target life directly to get your grudge uh, settled or fulfilled. And so he says that they seek to solve their frustration by taking it out on other people. So he says, sometimes he's mean to his children or he's mean to his wife or she's mean to her husband or mean to people around them because you can't find life itself. Life is intangible in a sense. It's invisible. We don't see life. We see manifestations of life and you can never take life and hit life and beat up on life. So he discovers he can't get life itself to beat on and pay back for what the universe has done to him. So he finds people that are tangible and he finds things that are tangible and he takes this bitterness and this hate out on those things, the bitterness within and the anger, he becomes angry with the universe and he fights the universe through people and things. So he says they react with bitterness and mercilessness and meanness. And I, I want to pause on that mercilessness there. Because another response that we're going to jump right into is that of withdrawal. And we could talk about people withdrawing and saying, oh, that's not my problem that other people are suffering. Mercy is a response to the suffering of others. So this is a different kind of bad response to the suffering of others. Instead of just saying, oh, that's not my problem, it says, screw you, you've got it coming to you. I hope you suffer even more. So that's, you know, kind of an aggressive response. <clears throat> Another possibility, the response, as he says, of withdrawal. He says they may withdraw completely into themselves. They withdraw completely and they build walls around themselves. They don't allow anyone to penetrate and they develop detachment into a neat and fine art. And why are they doing this? So that they don't feel the pain, so that they don't have to register that things are the way that they are. And he says, now it's kind of interesting. There's a bifurcation here says that they're neither happy nor unhappy, just indifferent. They, they don't take a stance on anything. They pull themselves away from it, hiding themselves within their own self. But is this really so indifferent? Martin Luther King says that they are fighting the universe, not with bitterness, but with a silent hate. They withdraw from people. They withdraw from the world. They withdraw from everything and turn totally within this. They feel is a solution to the problem. Why do they withdraw? Because they're not going to give anything to the universe. They're not going to go against it. They're not going to hurt people deliberately, but they're sure not going to help anybody or allow themselves to be reached. The third response he talks about at greater length is that of creative will, as he calls it. He says it involves the exercise of a great and dynamic will. Now this and the examples that he gives might lead us to think, ah, well, maybe I don't have the resources to do that. I'm just a little person. I don't have a great or, you know, what I would call dynamic will. I'm not even sure what that would look like, except perhaps in these distant examples of, of wonderful people who overcome, you know, whatever adversity they're running into. But that's, that's just not me. And King would say, oh no, that is you. All of us do have the potential for this. Greatness is not some sort of benchmark. It is instead what you're going to do with that faculty of will. So he says, 
This is the individual who stands up in his circumstances and stands up amidst the problem, faces the fact his hopes are unfulfilled, recognizes reality. But what does this individual do? Instead of saying, screw you world, I'm going to get back at you, or screw you world, you're not going to touch me. This individual says, I have one thing life left. Life has beaten it down. It has broken away from me many things, sometimes my physical body, but at least it has left me with a will and I will assert this and I refuse to be stopped. The will is an interesting thing. Some people would like to say we don't have a will, but it's clear that we do make choices and however conditioned those choices may be, we do have some degree of agency and freedom and taking itself and deciding what to do with itself. That is something that, you know, for a long time, including the people that King himself has studied, like for example, Augustine, great philosopher of the will, realize that the will is something that directs itself. So he goes on and he says, even if Rome and Spain are blocked off my itinerary, I refuse to be stopped. I will go somewhere else. And this is the man who stands up in the greatness of life. He discovers the power and the creativity of human will, and he faces any circumstance with the power and force of his will. Now that makes it sound like you just kind of like, ooh, you need, you need to just like decide and everything's going to go great. No, King talks about dogged determination, which means that you're probably not going to win. You're not going to succeed every single time. And the successes that you enjoy will probably be partial. They'll include elements of failure and not being completely filled, right? He says, every now and then life will beat me, push me to this side and that side, but I will stand up to it. I will not be stopped. And then he uses this interesting example of taking a flight uh, across the, the uh, Atlantic, flying to London from New York and going one way, it's quicker than going the other way. Why? Because there's a headwind going one way, which helps you along. And there's a tailwind, or actually I've got it reversed. There is a tailwind helping you out that is behind you. And then a headwind uh, taking you the other way that is, is interfering with you. Well, sometimes life is like that. You start something out. It seems quite easy. You've got a tailwind. You're struggling against resistance the whole time. Well, you got a headwind. And King will say that plane itself is actually showing what we're talking about here. It still gets to New York, right? Even though it has to go against a headwind. Um, and so he says, you know, we, we can apply this to, to everybody. And he talks about the condition, uh, which makes perfect sense, of uh, African Americans and the struggles that they have to face. There are many headwinds. And he says that, um, you know, this doesn't prevent people from exercising a creative will. And what is the result of this? He says, these people, by their creative dynamic will, this is really quite important, gave to the world something to keep it going. Instead of saying, screw you world, they said, I'm going to respond to the challenges that you're placing in front of me, the frustrations, the dashing of my hopes, the interference with my dreams, the failure to provide me with any sort of solution. I'm going to respond to this by doing what I'm doing, and that will give something back to life. And again, remember, Life exists in its manifestations. This means giving something back to other people. So he gives you a few examples of this. The spiritual, the only original and creative music in this nation, he calls it. But he also says it gave to the world generations of young men and young women who have made marvelous contributions. And he gives you a whole bunch of of examples of these people. And he says, out of these black men and these black women came something that keeps the generations going. If they had turned to the first method of bitterness, it wouldn't have come. If they'd withdrawn and turned to silent hate, it wouldn't have come. 
but it came because of the creativity of the will and the dynamic quality of it and the determination to stand up amidst all those forces, amidst the darkness of human circumstance. Now, what does that mean? There is a continual intergenerational, we could even say establishment of community and tradition. We recognize that this is not just you know, a, an age old problem, but that we exist within a matrix in which many people have had this response of creative will. Many of them famous people, but many of them humble people who just did what they needed to do, perhaps in our families, perhaps in our communities, and that we can continue on by adopting a similar response, which won't look the same as their response because we're in different circumstances. And he's going to make one other point. He says, strangely enough, when you come to this point, you don't worry about suffering. You don't die because you don't get to Spain. You come to see suffering might make you stronger and bring you closer to God. Now, he's talking to a religious audience here, of course. It's a sermon, but we could easily think about this is, uh, you know, revealing to us uh, whatever it is that you find transcendent. And so his, his charge to people is discover this, go out anew into the experiences of life. I assure you, you will meet your Spain in the sense that you will never get there. You might get to your Rome as a prisoner, not as a free man, but if you have the power and dynamics of a human will, nothing in all this world can stop you. Why? Because you refuse to be stopped. You have the dogged determination to exist and the courage to be. And this is where it ends, having outlined the problem and then these three potential solutions and advocating for the response of creative will.